So, so welcome here, everybody, and especially Sepide Pashami, uh, who is with us at RISE at the Data Analysis Unit as a senior researcher and as an associate professor at Halmstad University. Uh, and and uh, you have a PhD from Örebro University, I think. Yes. Uh, um, and today we're going to hear about causal aware machine learning. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, today I thought that uh, you have probably heard about causal inference and uh, I thought the topic that could be interesting for several of, of us is how can we augment machine learning with causal inference studies? And that's going to be the focus of the talk. So if you look at uh, uh, today, we, we see that there is a rapid development of AI and autonomous systems. And usually this rapid development of AI is uh, due to a success of machine learning algorithm for doing prediction tasks, for doing classification, for doing uh, learning by demonstration and finding patterns generally. Although in order to reach general AI, we kind of need to uh, go beyond that and reach a human intelligence. What do I mean by human intelligence? Perl in his uh, paper uh, has defined it as follows, that humans are have the ability of uh, planning and controlling and creating a representation of their envir environment. At the same time, they query this representation and also they distort it by an act which called imagination. And in this way, they are able to answer the questions such as what if questions. So um, what are the what if questions? Most of the research questions that we have are actually what if questions and they are not uh, correlation based, but we treat them as a correlation based questions. And um, one example could be, what if I wouldn't have taken the medicine or something like that? And as we know, machine learning is very good in acting based on the observational data. But answering the questions that they have not encountered before and they have no examples of those is pretty hard for machine learning. What are the different questions that we can ask generally in the research domain. So Perl, again, in the same paper, categorized these uh, questions in three levels. The first level is the association level, which is that we are trying to answer the questions that are statistical based. So we want to see, um, for example, what does a symptom tells uh, about uh, uh, tell me about a disease. And this kind of what is questions are common questions that machine learning is really good at it. And then when it go to the next level, we are not just seeing something, but we can act also uh, based on the observation. For example, uh, we can try to test what will happen if I take your aspirin now. And this kind of problem, I can map it with something like reinforcement learning or even inference on the Bayesian statistic analysis. Uh, then uh, then the, the hardest kind of question is the questions that we have no way of collecting data anymore for to answer those. Uh, these are, he phrased as a counterfactual questions. So this needs imagination or um, another layer of reasoning on top of machine learning usually to answer those. And the example could be, what if I had not been smoking the past two years? The, the time has passed, so we have no way of measuring the, that. Uh, so, but in the today industry, we have lots of data. We have, uh, and everybody is interested to extract the knowledge from this data. So it's the same in causal inference community. So we want to see, can we extract a causal knowledge from just observational data? And that's a question that um, we want to answer now. Is it possible, for example, to calculate the causal graph? 
um, based on just based on the observational data? And the answer to this question is actually no. <laughs> it's a we cannot do that because um, to create a causal graph and be certain about it, we need to do the interventions, and sometimes the intervention is not possible. So what can we do? Uh, based on Perl, if we have certain assumptions, such as faithfulness, which describe that the, if there is a relation between variables, it's not accidental, and conditional independent test, uh, we can estimate something called Markov equivalent class of a causal graph. Not the causal graph itself, but a Markov equivalent one. Let me give you an example of what do I mean by that. In the example below, uh, the blue graphs are Markov equivalent classes. And if we use conditional independent test, we cannot recognize between these three cases, but we can recognize these three and the fourth one, which is in black. So that's, uh, so in a sense, based on the conditional independent test, we can say that the causal graph be belong to which class of uh, graphs. And, uh, and usually, in, in a great extent, this is a good information. Like, this is a lot of knowledge in it. Maybe it's not the pinpoint in the causal graph, but it's valuable. And how do we calculate this kind of causal graph based on the uh, observational data? The pearl proposed a, a, a structure for a causal graph. It suggests that there are sets of variables, and then we can... Um, calculate uh, the causal relation between uh, these variables, and we can show them as arrows. So for example, if uh, the cause can be apparent, and then there could be an arrow to a child, which is the effect of something. And in this graph, uh, it's designed in a way that uh, each variable will be a function of its parents plus some nodes. And the way to calculate this graph is uh, they usually uh, start with a fully connected graph and then they perform a set of conditional independent tests. Uh, for example, they say uh, if certain set of variables become independent given another subset of variables and then they remove a certain edge from the graph. They continue this several times till they end up having this causal graph. And that's partly the reason that uh, causal graph, uh, estimating the causal graph is computationally expensive because you have to perform several conditional independent tests or approximate sometimes uh, on what can be done. Uh, so, so far, the, now the question becomes like, can we use causality to solve some more complex problem or more real world problem? that machine learning is trying to solve and cannot do that. Um, I'm raising some questions. The first question that I want to discuss is, can we answer counterfactual questions? By counterfactual questions, if you remember, I was talking about what if questions, based on observational data only. Um, to answer that, I want to highlight a paper. Uh, this is kind of the only paper that I have seen in this area that to some extent pinpointing that it's possible to answer the contractual questions. So the title of the paper is that Contrafactuals uncover the modular structure of diff generative models. And uh, in this paper, what they try to do is, uh, for example, in, in your data set, uh, you might have, uh, they have an example with elephants, so I'm using the, that one. So for example, if there is a, in your data set, usually when there is an elephant, the background is a green background. And usually in your data set, you don't have an elephant that's in, on the street. <laughs> so their idea is that can we find, um, can we kind of generate, uh, in another example that you can see up there, if you have two different images, can we um, find some modular uh, characteristic in these images in an unsupervised way and we create some sort of a meaningful image which is the hybrid of those and uh, if you are you are all familiar with generative models deep generative models and we know that they are successful in creating the 
realistic images. Uh, so we can generate several images. And what we want to do, but usually the challenge with the generative models that they they are rarely have control on the uh, generating something meaningful from the data or have an understanding of what are they exactly generating. So what we are looking for is providing a disentangled representation of the data. Uh, and uh, by disentangled here, I mean that um, we want to find a representation of the data for these generative models, that if we change one factor in latent variable, we end up having a different, still meaningful uh, image in the original space. So in that sense, disentangle. And we don't want one changing one thing changes several things. Um, and in this paper, they also mentioning that uh, performing this based on a statistical independence is too restrictive. So they rely on something called counterfactual manipulation. What is that? Um, so the idea is based on something called independent causal mechanism. The independent causal mechanisms are the mechanisms uh, that they, they all together describe a process, but it, each individual one, when you change each individual one, you are not affecting the other ones. So in that sense, they call independent causal, causal mechanism. So we, want, we are looking for finding such independent causal mechanism. So what they do in this paper, if you look at here, they first map, uh, they want to map uh, their manifold to a latent representation. And they want to have a, be able to like uh, manipulate in one of the directions in the latent space and uh, uh, be able to extract uh, and create uh, new meaningful images. But they, what they are saying is that this latent, manipulating this latent space is very uh, restrictive for them. So what they do instead, they, they have an, uh, another layer called endogenous variables. And then they, what they do is they manipulate this endogenous variable, although they are not necessarily independent from each other because they have some common causes, but it's still like manipulating one of those will lead to a um, unique, uh, and meaningful images. And uh, in order to, uh, um, as you can imagine, sometimes these uh, hidden layers could be very huge in neural networks and uh, gener generative models. So what they do here uh, is um, they select uh, uh, different, uh, um, different uh, filters in this hidden layer, and then they cluster them, and they find uh, certain clusters of hidden layer that are more representative. And they assume that these are the modules that they are looking for. And by that, to create a new image, they select certain modules from one image, and then they select the rest of the modules from the other images, and they combine the images and they create these hybrid images. And the interesting thing is they do this in a fully unsupervised way. So they don't train that, okay, I want, for example, to change the hair, you know, they, they don't train that. So the modules will come automatically based on the clusters. Um, I mean, if you are working with image processing, you might not find this uh, particularly good examples of uh, generating realistic images. But given the fact that they didn't have a supervised input, it's quite impressive. Uh, so the conclusion here is that they managed to find uh, uh, mechanisms that correspond to this uh, uh, causal, uh, underlying causal behavior of the, the causal characteristic of the image. Okay, the next question that I want to talk about is, can we develop automatic data machine learning algorithm, data-driven machine learning algorithm? So in a sense, an algorithm that solves our problem without we label them and so on, knows what to do, <laughs> kind of. 
so this this is based on a paper that I presented in one of the previous uh, series uh, called Learning Independent Causal Mechanism. And the idea here is that um, they create a transformation of the digits of, in a data set, several tra transformation from noise, shifting to right, shifting to left, like um, um, inverse of an image, and so on. And, but they don't uh, create labels for the transformation that they have. So what they want to do they want to create a method in an unsupervised way. They transform it back to the original uh, space. The idea behind this method is that they develop several experts. And um, the idea that these experts are supposed to compete with each other in the transforming the example to the original one. And what they do is when they give an image, then each of these experts generate an output here. And the output, they look at it and uh, they check the, this output with the distribution of the original data. And then they compare and then they choose the one that is closer to the uh, distribution. And then they update the weights of that experts. And also they penalize the discriminator for um, with regard to the other experts in the system. So in a sense, they manage uh, to create an automatic algorithm for reversing this mechanism without having any supervision. Okay. The next question that I want to connect to causality is a little bit another example is domain adaptation. Can we perform domain adaptation and can we take advantage of the causal relation there? The answer is in this paper is kind of yes. So the paper that I want to talk about is domain adaptation by using causal inference to predict uh, invariant conditional distribution. Usually when we do feature selection, uh, we rely on a predictive power. We want to select features that in a, in a better, in a possible way, kind of in the best way possible, uh, correlates with our target variable. But sometimes this uh, predictive power does not match as when we want to change from one domain to another domain. So instead, for, we are looking for uh, features that are invariant uh, between the different domains that we have or source and target domain that we have. And we want to do this using leveraging the causal information. Um, let me explain it with an example. Uh, in this paper, they have this example. Uh, the task that they have is they want to predict the uh, target variable x2. So x2 is equal to y. And uh, they can use either x1 or x3 for do, do this uh, prediction. Uh, and uh, there are two colors here. So the green color belong to the one domain and the blue color belong to another domain. So what they do is if you look at it, uh, if you just look at the blue data, uh, then X3 is a better uh, predictor for X2 than X1. It's much less noisy, but however, X3 um, data doesn't transfer to a different domain. And uh, while X1 still follow the same pattern, although there is a little bit of shift, but still like it's a good in, good predictor for X2 in both of the domains. So that's, that's what I mean by invariant, pre using uh, causality for predicting the invariant features. And also if you look at the causal graph, the X1 is kind of a cause of X2, uh, the data that's generated, and X3 is not. And this uh, C is the domain that affects both of them. So it, it still makes sense. Uh, the next question that I want to bring it up is can we increase robustness and security of machine learning algorithm using causal inference? Um, 
as some of you might know or encountered before, deep neural networks are usually susceptible to uh, minimal adversarial attacks or adversarial perturbations. And, uh, um, and by adversarial attacks or adversarial perturbation, I mean the kind of changes that are not visible to the human eyes, but they are, uh, they are um, kind of mislead the algorithm. For example, human eyes would still like, recognize the zero in the first row, but a uh, machine might make a mistake and recognize it to a different digit. And uh, they would like to use uh, causality for creating an algorithm which is a little bit more robust and in toward adversarial attacks. The paper called Toward the First Adversal Adversary Robust Neural Network Model on MNIST. Um, so the idea that they have is uh, um, they, they can benefit from a concept of switching from causal uh, uh, studying in a causal direction to un uh, anti anti-causal direction to a causal, transform a problem which is anti-causal to a causal problem. What do I mean by that? Usually in this industry or in real world setting, what we have is uh, we observe an effect and we want to predict the cause. So this, this formulation of the problem that we have data from effect and we want to predict the cause, it's called cause anti-causal formulation of the problem. And the reverse would be when we have a cause, the data from the cause, and we want to predict the effect. But um, if you can imagine, the idea is that when we, we go from cause to effect, it's much harder to um, attack this direction because if you change a little bit of the cause, you will get a huge change on the effect. But when your problem is from effect to the cause, if you make even a little bit of a uh, change on the effect, um, then you might not necessarily um, notice the change on the cause. So that's why um, performing like a, a machine learning task on the anti-causal direction is less robust than uh, the causal direction. So this is the base for their idea to solve this problem. So in an analogous way, uh, what we do is uh, we usually have, for example, discriminative model and generative models. The discriminative model, you have data and you want to predict the classes. And in generative one is the vice versa. So it's, it's in a similar way. What they do is they reverse this process. So they use a generative model and uh, then they predict a distribution of the data and then they use, a ba they use base rules to solve uh, the problem in the articles of direction at the end. So this is the idea behind this paper to how to make it more robust using the causal inference. So if I want to kind of summarize uh, what I have said, we want to um, discover causal relations uh, from observational data and in real world setting. And we wanted to see if this is possible or not. And surprisingly, we saw examples that not only is possible, but it can also answer some of the very difficult uh, machine learning problems. For example, it can answer uh, counterfactual questions. It can uh, uh, create an automatic data-driven algorithm. It can improve domain adaptation. It can increase robustness and security. And it's not limited to this. For example, it can also increase the explainability there are lots of work that connect causal inference to explainability. And also, it might do other things like decreasing a need for a huge amount of data. Thank you. That was my talk. Thank you, Sepede. Um, oh, by the way, um, I, the reason that I chose so many different topics was I'm hoping that maybe this will 
bring up discussion or future collaborations and so on. So I was hoping that maybe I can attract some, some of the audience. So do we have some comments or questions from the audience? I cannot see the chat. Hey, Olaf, I'm just here. Can you hear me? Hey. Yes. So I'm out walking, but I hope I can, you can still hear me. I may have missed some of the uh, talk, so sorry if I asked a question that's already been answered, but oh. I remember an old uh, YouTube course that took about 15 years ago that was on Bayesian networks mm -hmm. and about reconstructing the structure mm -hmm. that those have. And I'm not talking about you know Bayesian neural networks. I'm talking about prop proper, like probabilistic uh, mm -hmm. Bayesian networks that have you know conditional probability tables in each node. Bayesian belief um, network. Yeah, they also called belief network. Yeah. So what we did in the experiment was basically taking a rather large uh, network, perhaps uh, 100 nodes in it, and then removing all the edges. And the edges, you know, has a direction. And they point to you know what the dependency is, and in some sense that's some kind of causal dependency that they have. Mm -hmm. And then we use a specific like iterative algorithm to try to reconstruct the edges that that network had. And we were able to do that with like 98 percent accuracy. Now that of course it's never going to be 100 percent, and we never can be certain. But mm -hmm. when can we ever be certain about any prediction in any type of task? But I was surprised that, you know, for even these kind of rather large network with 100 nodes in it, we were able to reconstruct at least the conditional dependencies between these 100 nodes. Would you consider this to be causal inference by reconstructing the edges between a Bayesian belief neural network or network, not neural network? Definitely, yes. I mean, there is a huge community that uh, is still working on um, uh, how we can extract and create this causal network. I'm calling them causal network. But uh, so uh, the idea is that, uh, so most of the research on that area is actually how we can speed it up, how we can approximate and uh, how we can extract useful knowledge from it. We, they all know that it will never be 100%, but as long yeah. as you can extract uh, useful information from certain, uh, even um, inference of certain part of that graph, I think that could mm. be valuable. I mean, nice to hear that. You know, I, I had a number of discussions with people that says you can never, never, ever infer causal relationships from observational data. And uh, I, I don't think that's true. I think you can infer, not to 100%, but to a certain degree of accuracy, exactly. the causal relationships. And I usually give this example of, if you have a simple node of, it's raining outside, um, you bring an umbrella, and uh, Adam goes out. And then you can think, is it raining because you brought the umbrella? Or do you bring the umbrella because it's raining? Mm -hmm. And then by using uh, simple observational data, you can rather easily infer that you bring the umbrella because it's raining and not vice versa. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, these kind of people that are so uh, demagogical in, in saying you, know, you can never do that, it's kind of frustrating. And I hope you agree that it is possible to a certain degree of accuracy, at least, to do infer causal relationships, right? Exactly. So the, the idea is that there are proof that you cannot do it 100%. Uh, so yeah. there, there are proofs that we, it says that it, the 100% doing based on observational data is impossible. Yeah. But the field has been growing since also like uh, it has been starting to merge with machine learning in a sense. Yeah. So uh, the attitude toward that has been changing, I would say. Uh, yeah. People are more toward how can we use the concepts even here in causal inference to improve the models that we have. For example, the example that I showed uh, to find uh, disentangled latent features. Yeah. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, thanks for the input. I'm, I'm glad I, I have your agreement on that it's possible to do it. It's, so, and I would challenge anyone that can says they, they say that can predict anything to 100% accuracy. That person I would love to argue against. Uh, 
That's cool. Thank you for the answer. Do you have some more questions? Uh, do you have the chat open, Olof? I uh, have the chat open at uh, some times. Uh, but you can you can surely uh, write questions in the chat if you like. Uh, if you I was I was thinking that since many of you are working on image processing, so mm -hmm. you will tell me that this is a terrible reconstruction, like a hybrid image. <laughs> this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on what your what your what your task is, right? Yeah. Um, it is <laughs> terrible in a sense. <laughs> But uh, yeah, given that they back. didn't have labels, it's impressive. <laughs> yes, but but also uh, disentangling um, underlying factors is is also a very very difficult task. Um, so I'm 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 not sure I have a question about that paper, uh, and I haven't read it, uh, but I find it uh, I find it uh, really interesting the connection between the the disentanglement and the and the causation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is one example. Actually, this is the first example that I can see that they are using this idea of conditional independence mechanism to mm -hmm. uh, in such an application, kind of. So the idea would be where else we can use this. Uh, it doesn't have to be images. Mm -hmm. Can we, can we, for example, find underlying causal mechanisms of uh, certain policy or um, it, that, that's where I, what I was thinking. Like, this is mm -hmm. one example that is just hint that it so, might be possible. So in a work that, that we did with generative models uh, closely related to the disentanglement was, was that we tried to privatize or, or censor images uh, in the way that we had uh, tagged features such as uh, and and it was faces like like this one so the celeb A data set and we would we we tried to censor whether a person is smiling uh, and then smiling is correlated largely with with uh, gender and and a lot of other things uh, and and so so it it becomes this trade off do we want to retain the gender in the in the in the censored image, um, when we when we want and we want to generate sort of a random, independent, random smile on this person. Mm -hmm. um, so they were not independent mechanisms. <laughs> they, they weren't. They weren't. Uh, yes. Good point. Okay. More questions. We have a, a question in the chat. I don't have a mic, unfortunately. Uh, and this is related to Anders' question. Do you see a relationship between non-spurious correlation and causal relationships? For example, colored MNIST task. Uh, is there a fundamental difference between true causal relationships and observations that are robust against spurious correlations? Uh, sorry, I, I need to... Uh... Could you please repeat it, the question? I can repeat the question, yes. It's about this one. Um, do you see a relationship between the non-spurious co correlation and causal relationships? That's the question. And then he has a, an example. Uh, so the co example is uh, a colored MNIST task. Uh, is, is the paper you're showing the colored MNIST? Because the colored MNIST, uh, you have colored the, the, the digits and, they're and the colors are correlated with with the the, the label right mm -hmm. uh, and so the example here is is there a fundamental difference between true causal relationships and observations that are robust against spurious correlations okay I mean uh, I, if uh, I will answer but at least we can have discussion around it so uh, Sometimes we see a correlation in a data or two variables. For example, in that sense, when there are uh, MNIST digits, I guess I haven't seen that data set, but I guess that when we have more colored uh, uh, on on the pixel space, then this will can be correlate highly with a class label. And mm -hmm. but but actually the underlying cause is how many pixel space that affecting both of those. So. 
so the, this is a kind of a inherent uh, uh, in it's it's a correlation but it's not necessarily the causation of it um so if you have a common cause that affecting two things um then usually if you just observe these two, you will see a correlation, but there is no causation between them. And if you use that as a prediction label, you will end up predicting something wrong. But if your cause is the input to the first one and the first one goes to the second one, then usually using that uh, two variables at the end, although you see a correlation, it will not lead to a wrong answer. So I think here is the case uh, for your example. The correlation will not lead to a wrong answer, but um, because the shape is not uh, one common cause to do and a, no correlation between them. I think if that's- But, but isn't, isn't one answer also to this question, if I understood it right, that there are clearly non-spurious correlations which do not relate to a single causal link, because as in Sepedes' example, there is one, there can be one feature that affects two other variables, and those variables will be correlated. It's not a spurious correlation, it's a real correlation, but there is no direct causal link between them. Wasn't that the question? I, I think that is the case in colored MNIST. Uh, mm. So, so you, you insert, you design the correlation, you, you sample the images with uh, with colors uh, that are correlated uh, with the label, yes. Uh, and okay, so there's an explanation in the chat. Uh, in a color demnist, the colors are intentionally correlated, but at test time they switch uh, they switch it around so the colors are no longer correlated. Mm -hmm. um, so so you can get a low training error just so to, even... to that to, to, to just to detect the color in the images. Um, so you even even have another variable which is affecting the training and test set from my point mm -hmm. of view. So yes. you have even one more variable in that you didn't consider here. Mm -hmm. And that makes it hard for the classification. Uh, yeah. And that and that's uh, that's also where it connects to domain adaptation, right? Uh, the elephant is is often with with green grass around and and not in the street. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, you are looking for features that are not dependent on that colors. Mm. Isn't the color damnist very similar to another application of causal inference in in medical field where you have a treatment? Mm -hmm. But the treatment may be given uh, in a way which correlates with uh, the symptoms that the patients have. Um, and you have to control for that, that other variable, which is uh, exactly as you say, like the test, testing is different than, than, than training. Uh, there's a, another variable that affects that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why also like in medical domain, they always have this control group. Uh, I agree, like uh, in order to remove the other factors or force the model to learn the right factors, kind of. And what you would do then on the MNIST would be that you would stratify on the color, I suppose, so that you can you can do some pair, kind of paired matching or something to elicit that relationship and then be able to find the, uh, the relationship sort of controlling for, for color. Uh, but yeah, this is not my field, but I, I just thought it was similar to the, the treatment case, the medical case. But, but that means that you need to have the assumption that, that the color is, is separate. Does it? Or can you control it uh, in some other way? It depends. Uh... Like, if we talk about feature selection, yeah, you're right, they are not separate. It's not easy to remove them. 
if if you don't know what 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 mm -hmm. the cause is. Um, mm -hmm. There's a comment in the chat exactly. So this relates to, for instance, the work of Leon Batou, where he argues that part of the problem is that we do shuffling and thus lose information and distributional differences between the data sets. Mm -hmm. So he proposed a few models where you compensate distributional shift between data sets and thus eliminates those spurious color correlations. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally also the domain adaptation methods can be used here. So if you have few examples of your test case, then you try to adapt the two and you try to map it in an, like a third dimension that uh, matches these two, two different distribution together. Then you can handle it. But that's not necessarily causal. Mm -hmm. Do we have some more questions for Sepide? I might have a question. Uh, so the examples you give are on the image, uh, working on images with, with large models, but um, for some of us that are working more sort of on engineering applications and uh, less on the theoretical applications of these, would you have any advice on what are good problems these uh, methods? Mm, I mean, generally we have been looking for like applications to apply some of these methods. So I'm interested in your application to start with. But um, it depends what you want to do. So the starting point would be extracting this causal graph and doing certain inference to have an understanding of what's happening, I ah. would suggest. So I, I mentioned in the talk there was parallel approach on the PC algorithm. But but if you have one of these challenges, for example, if you have domain adaptation, then you can try this invariant feature selection. It doesn't matter if it's an image or not. Or if you want, uh, for example, to increase robustness, I think that's quite possible to do. Adding explainability, I think, um, to some extent. It's, it's harder. <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> um, or, for example, the second paper that I talked about, that was this um, competitive agents that they were trying to clean the data. So, I mean, the data was uh, still MNIST and images, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, so as long as you have a distribution of the data that you know that they are kind of clean, uh, and you have a distribution of the data that you don't know what are the different transformation that you want to do, then you can match these distributions. Um, if I, these are the, the ones that I see at the moment. But you, maybe you can tell me more about your application. No, I'm I'm uh, I'm out there looking for an application, but it might be something uh, when working on satellite images. I do that sometimes, uh, but also anomaly detection or or uh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, time series. Uh, and also, uh, Anders, my colleague uh, in data analysis unit, he implemented some of these uh, methods on the medical data. Um, yes, yeah. for cancer, child cancer, finding uh, causes of child cancer. Uh, treatment. Maybe so, Anders, you can say a little bit about it. Um, can, can I? Um, so there the idea was that we wanted to find the, the direct causes of, well, if you have people with child, child cancer, they get quite heavy medical treatments and later in life, uh, 10, 20, 30 years later, they may, may have adverse effects of that treatment. But of course, you don't know, is it the treatment that caused those effects or is it the fact that they had the cancer, that maybe the cancer had ruined some, some tissue in, in the body? Or is it maybe some predisposing factors, some genetical factors that increased the, uh, both the, like the, the probability of getting a cancer and the probability of getting those later health effects? So we wanted to disentangle this. And then we used also these causal, uh, same kind of causal methods 
to to distinguish yeah indirect effects from direct effects yeah that's one example of an application at least and we have more we we, we looked a little bit and it the process industry on on steel uh, uh, hardening or, or uh, heat what do you call it surface treatment of steel or you you heat it up Mm-hmm. And then uh, also it's interesting which effects in the steel are actually affecting which and which are just indirectly correlated. So that we, we used it a little, a little bit. We have not used it so much, but you could go get some hints at least that oxidation might actually not be, uh, or rather losing coal might rather be uh, uh, a, an effect of oxidation rather than a separate effect, for example. So there are clearly we are we are in the verge of, of starting using uh, these causal things for real applied stuff now, and that's very exciting because it's uh, yeah M- much of it has been theoretical. I think much of the research. Okay. Something that comes to my mind as another kind of example is uh, finding a root cause of, uh, uh, for example, a failure. Mm. That could be also another example. Thank you. Yes, maybe something in the normally detection or uh, yeah, root cause analysis. But thank you for your answer. Could I ask a question? Sure. So when it comes to different kinds of uh, data which we would like to find the root causes of, is there is there a difference between, let's say, continuous data for images and discrete data? For example, text or a graph, if we would like to... So this this entangling you showed, could we perform... Is there a limitation, essentially, uh, in the kinds of data we can do it for? In theory, no. Um, if, as long as we can like have embedding in the middle that translate those kind of text data to some embedding, I think we can manage. But uh, practically, I haven't seen anyone who really applies it on that. So I'm... I like to do that as a research kind of topic, maybe. Excellent. Then we, we should talk more. Yeah. So we, we're working in the domain of uh, uh, chemical compounds and toxicity. Mm-hmm. And one thing we are very interested in is determining what, what part of that compound contributes to its toxicity class. So, for example, it might be wh- whether a compound is toxic or not. Uh, mm-hmm. That's something we would very much like to be able to figure out. So we should talk more about this. I think that's a good example, actually. That's just part of the reason that I was thinking that I can present today for, for finding applications, maybe. Very good. Could I, um, I'm the share game, um, just a more philosophical question, it would be fun to hear. And just been speaking to these kind of dogmatic people, you know, they usually refer to this causation versus correlation problem, you know, and, and they basically say that, you know, you have number of sunglasses sold versus number of ice cream sold, and obviously, you know, correlation cannot be causation because there is some kind of confounding factor. You know, the sun is out that you don't have in a data set. And then you usually use that as a reason for saying you can never do causal inference. And I'm just trying to find a way to have a good reasoning for why you can do quarter inputs. And of course, if you don't know the confounding factors, like the sun is out, then of course you can't assume you can do quarter inference. But assuming that you do have the most important factors in there, then I would argue that quarter inference is possible. Would you agree that that is a proper way to reason about you know, if quarter inference is possible? Uh, so that's uh, something that uh, I, I will be careful how to answer. So uh, the the thing is, um, in if if I want to answer it philosophically, you never have all the parameters that are affecting something. Um, so you we always abstract things uh, to some levels or one or another level of this discretion kind of. And, uh, but the important thing is uh, we need to be careful about is uh, the, the relations that are changing or appearing as uh, um, 
for example, uh, you are maybe familiar with this Simpson paradox. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar. Yeah, yeah, sure. So in that example, so if they wouldn't uh, condition on the treatment, then all their analysis is kind of lead to a wrong answer. And uh, the idea is that what we get from causal graph is extra knowledge that will help us to kind of uh, in, do better decision making. Not we cannot do that without it. Uh, but still, I agree with you that if we don't have all the variables, we, if we can get some information that there is a huge correlation between this, this is something valuable. And this can be a predictor, used predictor. And as soon as we figure out that, no, there should be another variable that's affecting something and we haven't measured it, I think then we can go and measure it, you know. Or uh, sometimes even there are algorithms that they can tell you that there is a latent variable missing based on the how the correlation, like single correlation or another higher level correlation affect that. So there are algorithms that can say that there is something missing here. But maybe they cannot say what, but uh, there are things you can do. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw some of paper about that actually as well. Uh, but you can find, as long as you have two variables that are connected and connected somehow, you can ensure if there is a third one. But if you don't have any, if you just have single variables, something, then it's impossible. And I thought I thought they showed that theoretically as well. But yeah, I agree. There are, there are ways to identify if there is at least one missing confounding factor under some conditions. Yes, but, but the point I'm trying to... Yeah, but I, I think the point that I'm trying to make is that if you simply assume you have the most important factors or features available, then you, I would argue that you can do cash cultural inference. Um, it would be fun to see if you agree with that. I do think so. Yes, I think so as well. I mean, at least it will not stop me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, <laughs> mm. but like usual, you, you cannot, you cannot always be sure that you can do it, but often there are clues enough so you can say something mm -hmm. so it will it's i think your friends are kind of they want to win the argument by by just adding complications yeah but suppose this happens and this, yeah they can always add those stuff but it's a matter of probability we can look at the data and see what is most likely and and definitely we can often say say something at least so, don't, uh, yeah. Yeah, at least this is our attitude toward it. Uh, so, um, no, it's a true attitude. Yeah. <laughs> the, the the, attitude. We, are not, we are not alone in the field. So, there, there has been changing, as I said, like people are starting to use causal inference and uh, kind of encounter the uh, limitation of it. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, we'll come back in uh, two weeks, I think, now. Um, because we're having a winter break in Stockholm next week. So we have a break. But uh, March 11th, Maria will give a talk next time. So thank you, Sepide. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.